welcome everybody. Welcome our families. Welcome our community to our high school curriculum adoption process. We are so excited to have you join us this evening. My name is Brooke O'Neill and I am the Director of Curriculum and Instruction for David Douglas School District. We have a team of teachers who have been working very hard this past year to make a very important decision for our students, and that is which high quality materials are we going to adopt um, that will be in our classrooms starting next year. First, I do want to thank our school board because our school board helps fund um, that our students have high quality materials in the classroom, and we know high quality materials matter. So our team started looking at seven different programs and tonight they've narrowed it down to two and we are excited to share those two programs with you. You're going to hear about our adoption process. You're going to hear from each publisher and there'll be time for you to ask questions specifically to the high school. You can ask questions to the publishers. You can ask questions to any of our leadership team who you'll get to meet shortly. Um, and then we're going to talk about next steps and how we can get input from you. So again, thank you for being here. I do want to remind you that at the bottom of your screen, you have a Q&A icon. And if you have a question, you can type it in that chat. We will either answer in real time um, if we're able, or we may answer directly in the chat. So please use that feature. We want to make sure this is interactive and that we get a chance to hear from you. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Rochelle to kick us off. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to give a giant shout out to all the teachers that you see on the screen in front of us. These are our teachers um, currently who have been helping all year long with our math adoption process. You might recognize a few of their names if you have students currently enrolled at David Douglas High School or Fur Ridge. And if you are a middle school family um, looking forward to joining the high school next year, these will likely be some of the names that you might see come across your child's schedule. My name is Rochelle Zimmerman at the bottom. You'll see me listed as the K-12 Math TOSA. That means I get to help organize and facilitate math direction um, across the district. And I'm going to be joined tonight with Carrie Foster, who you'll hear from very soon. She's our online curriculum integration coordinator. And Elise Hall is helping us out tonight by monitoring the Q&A box that you can use throughout the presentation. She is our assistant director of title programs. And of course, you heard from Brooke O'Neill, our Director of Curriculum and Instruction. So I'd like to hand this to Carrie. She's going to walk us through a little bit of how our process has been um, organized throughout this year. Good evening, David Douglas community. Um, I'm Carrie Foster, the Online Curriculum Integration Coordinator. We have a very thorough adoption process that takes about a year. The K-12 Math Adoption Committee was formed last spring. These are teachers who volunteered to be on the committee knowing the very heavy time commitment. This year long commitment starts over the summer with professional learning through a book study. The book the committee engaged in, Choosing to See, set the foundation for helping all students unearth the potential to be powerful mathematical thinkers. Gathering student voice is a very important part of our adoption process. In the fall, we conducted a survey to students asking what they like about math and what helps them learn math. Also in the fall, the committee started to participate in anti-racist, anti-bias trainings, which continue throughout the full adoption process. The committee also worked to develop six priorities based on student survey data, our district freedom dream number one developed by our staff of color and professional learning. The committee then reviewed the highest scored curriculum vetted and approved by the Oregon Department of Education. They ranked their top four curriculum and we invited those publishers to present in person. The committee then narrowed down to two curriculum for piloting. So we are um, piloting the lessons in classrooms as we speak, and we are gathering feedback from students, teachers, and the community. So in April, the committee will review student, teacher, and community data collected during the pilot, as well as their own scores of each curriculum. A final recommendation will be presented to the board in April. 
The committee members have engaged in over 35 hours of synchronous and asynchronous work for this adoption thus far, and there's more to come. So students are at the center of our work. We spent time in the fall gathering student input via a survey across all grade levels and surveyed nearly 3,700 students. Additionally, we conducted student empathy interviews. Empathy interviews allowed us to dig deeper into students' math experiences and help us gain understanding as to what our students' needs are and how we can best support them in math. From these two sources, we learned that students prefer engaging with multiple modes of math learning, such as games, manipulatives, and real world problems. Students value learning with individual and self-paced accommodations. Students want time to practice for proficiency. Students prefer opportunities to interact meaningfully with peers and to receive feedback. And students value hearing their classmates' math ideas in class. So all of our learning um, and feedback narrowed it down to these six priorities that you see here. These include student representation and math tasks and activities, learning activities that enable students to demonstrate their understanding in various ways, and provides feedback to help students develop math skills. Our teachers are in the process of piloting and trying out lessons to see the uh, the degree to which these priorities are embedded in the curriculum that we're piloting. You will see these priorities again in the community survey. We invite you to tell us the most important priorities for your student to succeed. Your feedback will be an important consideration for our committee. So with that, I will hand it over to Rochelle. Thanks. So you're all here tonight because you're interested in knowing what does math look like at the high school going forward. Um, and you have a really important role for um, us to really play. We're excited to partner with you because it's through your own reviewing of the curriculum information and really diving into the demo accounts, both um, as a parent or as a caretaker, and also maybe with your student and get their perspective on the demo account access. We also would love to hear your opinion because um, it's only through that communication back and forth that we can really use your voice to help guide our decision making processes. So I'm going to be showing you a little bit of our district website um, because your feedback is vital to our process. And we are asking for your input. Um, it all plays a giant part in our decision making. If you have questions, you've probably seen my name come across Parent Square um, or other avenues. I encourage you to contact me if you do have further questions, especially after tonight's presentations. But I wanna walk us through that um, access that you have on our district website. If you go to the district page, you'll see the math adoption image appear in the main district um, image reel. By clicking on the community input for math adoption link, you'll be able to learn more about CPM and Carnegie Learning, the two publishers you're gonna hear from tonight. We encourage you to seek out this um, page and really investigate some of the resources that CPM and Carnegie Learning have prepared for you as family and caretaker community members to access. Um, they're going to show share with us today some of their ongoing curriculum upgrades and um, processes and we encourage you to ask questions as they arise for you. If you scroll down a little further on this same page, you'll come to the um, community input survey and that's where we'd like you to access um, about a three minute questionnaire that is due by March 24th. It has been translated for you into our top five languages. Just by clicking on that same survey link, you'll be able to access the survey that is in your language. And again, if you have questions about accessing any of these features, please feel free to reach out to me directly. We are a little ahead of schedule tonight, which is always a good place to be. I wanna check in with our presenter and um, ensure that she is ready to go. 
and then Brooke, I'll let you do our introductions um, to carry us forward. Uh, thank you. So um, our first uh, program that we're going to share with you tonight, the publisher is CPM and the program is called Core Connections. And we are grateful to have Jenny White joining us tonight from CPM, who will have 20 minutes to talk through the program and share the highlights, share um, from a student's perspective. And then we'll have 10 minutes for you to ask questions. But please, if you have questions along the way, please put them in the chat. Um, some of them we can answer in real time and some we may wait till the end. So with that, Jenny, I hope you have um, access to share your screen and we will transition. Perfect. I believe so. All right, fabulous. Almost fabulous. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, cheers. Fabulous now. Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. I r really appreciate it. Um, I know your time is really valuable and and this is a really big investment into, um, into your schools, into your kids, and I think it's amazing that you guys are here. Um, so my name is Jenny White. I am the Regional Professional Learning Coordinator for the Northwest, um, which is a whole big title that means I'm, I'm your go-to person. I'm, I'm the one that's going to help answer any questions uh, if any come up along this process. I was did have the opportunity to teach CPM in the classroom. I taught the high school courses, almost all of them. Um, when I first started teaching, we did Algebra, Geometry, Algebra 2. Then we did a curriculum review, a lot like what you guys are doing right now. And we decided to stay with CPM, but transition over to the integrated books. And I taught integrated two, three, and AP stats. Um, so it's it's really neat to be able to come to it from a classroom perspective and then now be here where I work for CPM full time now. So before we kind of get started, I wanted to to share with you this this math problem. And it is it is a very simple addition problem. And so my answer for you is, is the answer correct? And how do you know? So I'm going to give you a second to think about that for a sec. Jenny, I don't know if you are looking at the same screen that we are, but we uh -oh. are currently looking at your teacher tip number 28 tab. That is not the tab we need to be looking at. My apologies. That's okay. Yeah, thank you. There's the teacher tip that's about to come out. <laughs> Jenny, we also have our interpreters um, interpreting for us tonight in five different languages. So we're really oh excited gosh. about that, but they are requesting if we could speak a little slower to help Absolutely. them um, so that they can interpret in real time. <laughs> so thank Absolutely. You. My apologies. No worries. We got to get through all the tech bumps and it's, we're ahead of schedule. So we're Fabulous. on a good pace. Sorry to get you back over maybe on to schedule here. Thank you for saying <laughs> something. All right, now do we see a weird pattern? Now we see a strange pattern, yes. All right, perfect. <laughs> All right, and I'm gonna have to ask again, do you still see a strange pattern? We are good to go. Fabulous, okay. And I will slow down. So my question is, can you, can you solve this? We're looking for patterns, we're looking at what's going on. All right, so I'm going to give you a hint because I'm assuming it didn't mean very much. So here's a hint. I'm going to give you 10 seconds. I'm going to try and give you 10 seconds. All right, was it helpful? Do you know that your answer is correct? I'm going to assume not that helpful. So I'm going to give you another hint. This one's only for five seconds. Now does the problem make sense? I'm going to give you another like 30 seconds or so to look at it. I had to draw it out. So is the answer correct? And how do you know? I'm hoping you saw the pattern that it once the once you saw the pattern, you know, like the almost the telephone grid or the just the normal nine keypad that it made sense. 
And that's what CPM tries to do is build that sense making. When you try and do math without the sense making behind it, it can really just cause a lot of struggle. And so CPM really stands behind this idea that when math is learned through understanding and, and understanding that, that structure, that students will be able to actually have hold on to that information, make it a part of them and be able to use it again later. So a quick agenda, we're gonna talk a little bit about CPM the pillars that we stand on, the lesson design, so what your students will see every day, a little bit about professional learning, and some closure. So CPM was written by math teachers or is written by math teachers. We got together somewhere in the 80s um, and decided that math could be better. And so they, a bunch of college professors, high school teachers, and middle school teachers got together and formed this consortium to create this curriculum. It really is uh, more math for more people, and it is we, we stand behind it. It's, it's by teachers for teachers. I know it sounds a little cheesy, but... We are a nonprofit, and, and again, our vision is that more math for more people. We're very passionate about it, and we really stand behind that and create a product to really help and, and really bring that into fruition. So talking a little bit about CPM, we stand on three pillars, and those are collaborative learning, problem-based learning, and mixed space practice. All of those come from current research that have been has been published and put forth. So CPM really promotes a deep understanding of those mathematical ideas. We still work through that problem solving and reasoning. We work on a positive disposition towards math and of course, procedural fluency. We do have a full uh, set of books from middle school all the way through AP Calculus and AP Stats. I know we're talking high school today, um, but I wanna talk a little bit more about the, the different pillars, the research-based pillars. So the first one is collaborative learning. The research really shows that when students have an opportunity to collaborate about their ideas and about math, that they're able to hold on to more. They get more and they hold on to more. The other thing is that problem-based learning it, which makes sense. If problem-based mean it has a context, that if you're looking at a, a, a math problem that doesn't have any context, it's really hard to hold on to that understanding. When it's problem-based, when it's in, in context, it makes that learning much more relevant and much more attainable. We also have mixed spaced practice. So that's the idea that you're going to touch on a concept and let it go for a little while. And then you're gonna pick it up again. You're gonna let it go and pick it up again. It can feel really disjointed at first, but there is a method behind the madness. The idea is that you're making connections. You're getting a chance to really think about the math and come back and work on it time and time again, which also helps with that math mindset, or excuse me, growth mindset that you are you can always do better, that there's no such thing as a math person, just people. So your students will be working together collaboratively. The idea is that students will be working together in teams. That Now teams can be a little or open for debate. Your teachers might do teams of two, teams of three, teams of four. I have done teams of five. It gets a little icky at the bigger ones, but those smaller groups really give your students an opportunity to share that information, to be able to talk about the math, look at their ideas, um, be able to ask for help in a safe environment. It's a lot easier for a student to ask help from their peers than it is from their teacher, but also have access to math on all levels. When you mix your groups together, students are going to hear uh, mathematical conversations from maybe slightly above, slightly below, and be able to explain their thinking. It's, it's beautiful. Now to support this, we have team roles, which are the resource manager, recorder, reporter, facilitator, and task manager. Those are just their team roles for the class period. And then we also have study team and teaching strategies, which are routines that your students will get used to doing that uh, may go towards a certain goal, like maybe getting your teams to talk more or being able to disseminate some information across the room. Jenny, and I'm so sorry to interrupt. Are you That's able okay. to slow down more for our- I can slow down more. Yep. Okay. Nope. I'm, I it's apologize. Exciting yeah. content. So thank you so much. Nope. I appreciate it. I talk fast and I'm, I can slow down more. Thank you. Of course. So with team building or with when you have your kids in teams, they do need to learn how to work in teams. So CPM supports that by creating these team building activities that are built right into the book. The first chapter is you're going to be looking at mathematical concepts, but through a lens of team building. That first chapter really gets kids talking about math and getting used to the idea of working together in teams. 
We've really found that as your teams get better and more coherent and are able to work together, the better that is, the higher the math rigor you can throw at them that they can really understand and digest. So I'd like to look at the next pillar, problem-based learning. CPM tells this beautiful story from sixth grade all the way up through the AP courses. And in, in that story, your students are going to meet characters, both mathematical and just silly characters, but they build on ideas and move throughout the entire curriculum to tell this beautiful story of mathematics. There's a lot of teacher support. These are the teacher notes for just one lesson. So teachers have a lot, uh, a lot to go through for sure, um, but a lot of support to be able to implement this really well. A lesson is gonna start with an introduction and this is going to start getting your students to think. It builds a need for the mathematics. And then they're going to work through some conceptual development. They're gonna to start to develop the ideas that are gonna solve that problem that was created in the introduction. They're going to do some problems that move them along that developmental cycle and really keep them engaged and critically thinking. The next problem is going to be an application where it applies that mathematical content or concept into a context um, and makes it so that they're using the math right away. There's also an extension and then also some practice. Every lesson is going to finish with a lesson closure. That's when you bring the class back together and address any misconceptions, make sure the goals of the lesson were, were met and that students really understand the math they were learning that day. We also have math notes boxes. They're not in every lesson, but almost. And they are that good old fashioned notes. They are definitions, uh, equations, explanations. Those notes are really a concise place for your student to go. It's a great resource to be able to refer back to. So I'd like to talk about the mixed space practice. There are lots of opportunities for your student to touch on a math concept. They're going to happen inside the lessons as those lessons cycle in the end of the chapter closure and again in, in future chapters. Here's uh, the, a list of problems that follow one concept. When I first saw this book, it's a little, it feels a little weird. You're going to open it up and it, the practice is not all in one place. It's spread out throughout the book. So this is an example of all of the problems students have for to, to be able to learn what this concept, so this is writing equations and inequalities. There's a lot of practice there. It's just spread out over time. You can see that we start in chapter two, chapter four, chapter seven, chapter nine, and 11. There's chapter closure at the end of every chapter. And this is a place for students to really consolidate their thinking over the concepts they've learned throughout. Uh, our books also offer a parent guide. This is a free PDF that's going to be inside your student's portal, or you can also purchase it if you'd like, but this is for the parents. This is uh, a good way to follow along with your student if you're interested, or if they come home and needing some extra help, this is a great uh, resource for you. It has those, good, uh, those great problems worked out, lots of steps, a bunch of practice problems, and then the answers as well. So as students are going to be working together, there's uh, multiple opportunities for them to, to engage with the math. There's, they're going to be actively learning, they're going to be working in their teams, and they're, they're, going to re, they're, they're going to readdress concepts over time. So there are lots of different ways for the teachers to talk to your students and to work through this. There are teacher-led discussions, partner work, teams of four, individual work time, and you can do work on presentations and portfolios if that's something you're interested in. Jenny, can I just add, I do want to acknowledge that we have some questions coming in. Great questions. We are going to answer those live in the question and answer because they're they're really rich and we want everybody to hear the answers. So if you can just hang tight, we will definitely get to them. Perfect. Oops. So we also partnered with Desmos. And so there are two ways your student can see this. They can see it with a lesson that's embedded where the entire lesson might be done on the computer, 
or there are also separate parts where the, the graphing is done. So it, it, you have these tools that are built into each lesson. To go over the homework, uh, the homework you're going to see is, has a lot less reading than the, the classwork problems do. They're, they're really designed for your student to be able to do on their own. They're, and it's going to show some of that spiraling. So usually the first problem is going to be from the classwork they did in class that day. And then from there, the problems spiral. It's usually a pretty small homework set. There's usually only about five problems. Um, but my students would be quick to point out, yes, that's true, but there's A, B, C, D. So there is some good practice there. We also offer homework help, and this is something that's in your student's ebook. And so they can get on here, and if they're struggling with a problem, they can click on it, and it has really structured and scaffolded hints and help to get them through those problems. Sometimes there's the answer, sometimes there's not. I did just want to touch quickly on professional development, that our, our professional development for the teachers is included in the purchase price, that we really want to take care of, of everybody. There was a big research paper turned out a couple years ago that talked about how, how teacher learning and curriculum together create a very powerful synergy. So we really want to work to leverage that. So the, the research, or excuse me, the, the learning events are really based on current research. Here are a few of the books that we've looked at to work through that, that and create that learning experience. You can see here, these are teachers. They're going to come into the learning experience just like your student is going to come into the classroom. So CPM, we really hit the, <laughs> we hit this pretty often, uh, is curriculum materials, it's professional learning, and it really is more math for more people. All right, and now I'd love to dive into those questions. Thank you so much, Jenny. We really appreciate you sharing about CPM. And the first question is, does problem-based learning mean more story problems? I, I always struggle with more. Um, but the short answer probably is yes. There is a lot of reading. Um, the Lexile score is really... Um, eh, I hate to even say what it is out loud. The Lexile score is really for third grade. Your students might still struggle with it, um, but that's something that CPM really did on purpose, that Matt, that reading in general is a struggle that we all have. And instead of, of not addressing the problem, we really try and, and help help with it. So that's where the teamwork can really come into play. But yes, is the short answer. Yes, there's probably more word problems. Okay, and the second question is, will these all roll out at all grade levels at once? If they build on each other from sixth grade, will seniors next year be successful with this curriculum? That's a great question. Um, I've seen it done both ways where they start um, either at sixth grade or ninth grade and roll it up slowly. And I'll be honest, there's some there's some advantages to that. There's some disadvantages to that. Um, in my own district, we didn't. We we went ahead and did everybody, like yesterday was one curriculum, today is CPM. Um, our seniors were still very successful because the math concepts are pretty universal. Um, there are gonna be a few holes that first year is going to be a little more challenging. It is a different style of teaching and learning. And it's it, it can be, it can be challenging, but that's why we offer so much support for the teachers so they can they can really help your students. Um, so either way is is an option an option. But yes, your upperclassmen will still be successful. And then the final question we have, and again, we, we are ahead of schedule, so please uh, feel free to ask more, is what does this look like for families who speak languages other than English? So we do have we, have, we have a couple of options. The first one is if you're looking for Spanish, the students have that available. So when you when you purchase a, an ebook, you get the English version and the Spanish version. Um, and it's also that Spanish version has been, I'm going to, uh, has been uh, translated. It wasn't just thrown into Google Translate, which is pretty okay, but I know Google Translate can have some problems. We actually went through and, act, and translated it. So if you're looking for Spanish, we've got a lot of that covered. If you're looking for another language, it is compatible with the common translators like Google Translate. We have Google Translate in the eBooks itself. Um, and then you can also, we meet all of the requirements in order to put it into the text to speech. So if you have students that might be hard of hearing or would rather have it read to them, that we meet all of those requirements. So you can take that and put it into an app and have it read to you or translate it. Okay. Are there any other questions about CPM or math in general that you would want to ask um, anybody here on this call? Make 
make sure we give appropriate wait time. Okay, Jenny, I do not see any other um, calls coming in or questions coming in. So definitely thank you so much for your time tonight and sharing about CPM. We definitely appreciate it. I think I just saw, I saw one more question. <laughs> Um, how can working in groups benefit everyone? That's a really great question. Um, working in groups helps ben benefit everyone in a lot of ways. The number one thing that I would tell my kids uh, is that the number one reason why Americans are fired is because they don't work in teams, that it's it's become such a job requirement no matter what your profession. And so teaching your students how to work well in teams collaboratively um, while they're in school is, is just a great benefit. Uh, the other thing that I loved about having my students work together in teams is that they were able to really help each other. It was, it was really amazing that I would say something and I'd be walking around and circulating, listening to the kids talk. And, you know, what they, uh, two kids would be asking and one would ask the other what's going on. And I swear this other student would say exactly what I said, but a light bulb would turn on. Like it, it just is hearing it from a peer is, is so powerful. And that ability to be able to talk about your thinking, get instant feedback and be able to to also critically think about other 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 ideas is such a powerful skill. And it, it is different. Um, it's not. It, it, it's more, you see that more in like a science classroom. Um, and we, we really would like to, the research shows that that's the way students learn the best. And so we've done what, uh, we've switched it and made it so that math can be really accessible. The other thing that makes it really beautiful is you have a lot of our problems are what we call low floor, high ceiling. And that's that there's multiple entry points into the problem. So you're going to have students that are gonna have different ideas about how to start a problem and, and what a great conversation to have. So it is lots of good stuff. And a classroom that's talking like that is, oh, it's so cool to hear. Yeah, Jenny, can you speak to this question? Um, some kids that don't understand or not communicate well will cause other students to fall behind. I, you know, I really understand that, that idea. Um, a lot of research shows that mixing up your teams often is really powerful for a lot of reasons. And that's, that's one of them. So when you're grouping your students together, that if you do it with a random, like a random name generator, so your students are sitting in, in uh, we call them, oh, heterozygous groups, they're, they're not going to be in one place long enough to, to A, rely on others, which can be a little bit of a catch 22, but I do, I, you know, I, I definitely understand. I taught this and I saw the kids that, you know, if, if I left them in teams for too long, they started counting on each other. Like if I know that you know this concept, well, I can just sit back because I know you got me. Well, if, if we trade teams really often, now I don't, I can't lean on you that same way. And on the other hand, you can also, the way students help each other is really beautiful. Um, and, and so being able to, to facilitate those conversations, being able to have kids work together, really show that students are not held behind, held back at all. In fact, quite the opposite. Thank you, Jenny. We'll wait one more minute just to see if there's any last minute questions. Absolutely. That are coming in. Thank you for your patience with my talking and with my tech issues at the beginning. Thank you. Oh, no, thank you. We we appreciate it. And if you think of a question for Jenny later on past this uh, presentation, you can email Rochelle. She's going to go over her contact information at the end, and uh, she can reach out to um, Jenny at CPM and get the answer for you. So thank you, Jenny. We appreciate you being here. Um, and with that being said, we will switch to our next publisher who thank you, Dan, for um, hopping on early. <laughs> we appreciate that. And then if we could, um, I don't know if we want to put our slideshow up again real quick. Yeah, let me grab there that go. real quick. There's formal and uh, the same. Okay. Thank you so much, Rochelle. So our next um, and our second uh program that we're considering. The publisher is Carnegie Learning and the program is called Math Solution. And we want to thank Dan Hunt, uh, who is here from Carnegie tonight, who will share the overview of Math Solution with you. And again, thank you, Dan, for hopping on early. We are ahead of schedule. We appreciate it. It's my pleasure. And I am thrilled to be calling in from the beautiful PDX airport tonight. <laughs> thank so, you. That's exciting. 
We hope you're going someplace huh? fun. Oh, yeah. Well, there's nothing better than being in Oregon School District, and that's what brings me there here. You go. Um, as you're pulling so up your I... screen, Dan, sorry to interrupt you there. <laughs> as you're pulling up your screen, I just want to make a reminder that we are live translating. So if you could just be conscious of your pacing tonight, um, appropriate pausing, and we've told all of our guests to ask questions in the Q&A um, icon down below. And then we'll have about 10 minutes at the end of your session to answer those questions live um, for our attendees. Okay. And it is 6.35. I was asked to do about 20 minutes of presentation and 10 minutes of Q&A. Is that still that is what we're exactly, looking for? That is exactly correct. Okay, so I'll try to uh, wrap things up here by 7.05. Um, and I'll also encourage folks to uh, put things into the Q&A and if, if I am being too fast, please interrupt me. If there are any questions that seem like they can be addressed in the moment, please interrupt me. I love an interactive session more than a old school direct instruction session. So I will go ahead and kick things off. Welcome to this overview of Carnegie Learning's High School Math Solution. My name is Dan and I am the account representative for Carnegie Learning supporting all schools and districts across the state of Oregon. I am excited to present and demonstrate to all of you our resources as we look to potentially partner with you in building the next generation of confident and capable mathematical thinkers at David Douglas. <clears throat> so, um, what is Car why do we do what we do at Carnegie Learning? I have people ask me, why are you so passionate, Stan, about working at Carnegie Learning? And do you work with that new math? Um, the answer is as simple as, well, math is not particularly new, but the world has changed a lot since I was in school. And we need to prepare students differently for the world that they will enter because a lot uh, is different from the world that I was looking to be prepared for when I was uh, in high school decades ago. Take a moment, if you will, to look at this list of a stack ranking of skills that Fortune 500 CEOs said were most valuable from 1st to 13th in 1970. The same skills were then presented to Fortune 500 CEOs in 1999. And those CEOs reorganized once again. What are some of the things that you notice about these two lists? Granted, 1999 was a long time ago, but in many senses, as far as I can tell, the top of the list from 1970 flipped to the bottom and vice versa in those intervening 30 years. If we look at the skills that Fortune 500 CEOs most valued in 2020 and removing the 13 that they had stack ranked and just ask those CEOs for is most important, we get a completely different list of skills that are needed in the workplace after college in 2020. My question to the audience, what would these skills look like when our students are actually entering the workplace in 2024 or 2028 or beyond? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and how we conceptualize the math classroom at Carnegie Learning. Before I jump into what Carnegie Learning is, I just wanted to mention that we were reviewed by a third party uh, funded by the Gates Foundation, Ed Reports. And Ed Reports found that the Carnegie Math Solutions attend the full intent of mathematical content contained in the standards and the modeling process, allowing students to fully learn each standard. Basically, we have been vetted by third-party educators who say, for telling a whole story, for making sure that students are prepared for math the way we want them to in the leading lines of math education. I think that students should be prepared for math education. 
And for a resource that teachers can find usable, Carnegie gets perfect or near perfect scores. So how do we do this? What does our classroom look like? We have two aspects, learning together and learning individually. Over the course of the year, about 60 to 80% of, uh, of classwork in a Carnegie classroom will be in learning together. And that is embodied on the left with these consumable textbooks. The other 20 to 40% will be embodied in our software, Mafia. So let's talk about what a Carnegie Learning Classroom looks like. You will notice it is not too far of a departure from many modern workplace environments. We have critical thinkers and problem solvers talking to one another, walking around, collaborating on solving problems, doing different projects at once, but also working together. We have a instructional framework called Engage, Develop, Demonstrate. Engage, where teachers have resources that activate student thinking, tapping into prior knowledge and real world experiences. I have never had a teacher tell me in my six years at Carnegie Learning, which have all been wonderful and fulfilling, by the way. In all that time, I've never heard a teacher tell me that they had a student ask them, well, when am I going to use this after high school? And that is because we introduced the content through that real world lens uh, initially. Then we move into develop. Students building deeper mathematical understanding through collaboration and questioning. Mathematical discourse is our goal here. And students defending their ideas, formulating their own ideas, and considering the ideas of others, working towards a powerful solution. And then we have demonstrate, where students reflect and evaluate upon what they have learned. This creates an opportunity for teachers at David Douglas to understand how well students understand the material and answer the question, are we ready to move on to new challenges? Just a little note for parents, our textbooks that embody that uh, learning together environment that you just saw, they all have a portion of the textbook called Live Hint. These reside in our assignments, which are given as homework. The homework pages have a QR code that allows you or your students to get guided hints on the work that students are taking home. We do not give students the answer, but we do provide uh, guidance based on the feedback that the students are giving us as they go through the content. Additionally, I should mention that we believe in consumable textbooks. Everything at Carnegie Learning that we do, dating back to our origins in cognitive science research in the 90s, is research-based. And the very best research shows us that if we have consumable textbooks with a lot of space for students to write their thoughts, and they have an artifact of their thinking, they will not only be more contemplative about the math, but they will retain their thoughts much longer. See here, I have a question. Will students be taking group tests? Tests. I will go ahead and answer that one at the end of the session, if that's fine. That's a good question, though. I like that. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about learning together. I wanted to talk about Mathia. Mathia is a adaptive software program. Through Mathia, we look to emulate as much as possible with our technology, the experience of each student having their own personal tutor. Students practice in Mathia at their own pace and show proficiency as they are able. If they show proficiency, they move into the next content area if they're not ready for the next content area, they stay where they're at. With Mathia, we are leveraging 
the power of artificial intelligence through assessing and providing appropriate instruction. So we're not just looking at what students know and not know. We also are looking at what are their strategies? What possible misconceptions did they have? And how can we use all of that information to deliver to the students the guidance that most fits that particular student's needs? Students work with the math in Mathia through multiple representations. We have word problems. We have graphs. We have tables. We have what we call virtual manipulatives. These working visual models allow students to literally put their hands on the screen, get their fingers into the math, and have that immediate sensation of what it is that they are working on as growing mathematicians. There's a question about accessibility on other languages. We'll jump into that. And is Mathia a homework option? I should mention that the design of Mathia is that students are doing it in class about 60 to 90 minutes per week. The time that students spend in Mathia because students are working at their own pace and because they have literally hundreds of different problems to answer, we want students actually talking to each other about their strategies to solve the problems in Mathia while they work through it, through, through their content areas. <clears throat> Text to speech, oh, sorry, through Google Translate, as you can see, here we have this drop down at the top of the screen. Mathia becomes accessible to learners through many languages. We also have lessons that are available in fully contextual, fully contextual translated Spanish. This combined with the text to speech tool is a very powerful source for newcomers to the English language. Text-to-speech itself is a powerful school tool for anybody who is not confident for whatever reason in their reading skills. However, we do want to encourage students to read because verbal comprehension and expression are part of being a strong mathematician. Mathia is powered by a cognitive tutor. It works together in conjunction with MathBooks, that consumable textbook, and helps Students further develop the concepts and skills of the course. The work students do in Mathia continually supports what they are doing in the learning together portions of the class. Mathia doesn't just select problems for practice. It focuses on building the right learning sequence for each student. Hints and just-in-time feedback are customized to address the individual students understanding that there are multiple pathways to do math correctly. So, important to note, very often there is one correct answer. We don't lose sight of that. You'll see here we have eight circles on the screen. This we call our skillometer. And for you translators, you can see it says skillometer at the top of the bar there. These are the discrete skills each student must demonstrate proficiency in in order to complete mastery of the workspace. Okay, I moved through these rather quickly, but I wanted to mention a few other things about starting e-learning. Our, well, we've been around for 20 years, uh, basically dating back to the 90s, so more than 20 years, getting up to 30. I came to Carnegie because I was tired of hearing people brag about how they couldn't do math. Um, that was a common theme that you would hear among folks who would say, I'm just not a numbers person. In the course of being at Carnegie Learning, I have had the chance to partner with hundreds of folks who are united around that mission of reversing the culture of a numeracy that we so often find among fellow adults today. We never would hear adults say, well, I can't read. I'm just not a reader. I'm illiterate. Um, we all understand, though, at Carnegie Learning, 
that being a strong mathematician is an important part of being a functional adult who solves problems and thinks critically in the age of information when we all are trying to separate the signal from the noise that is presented to us constantly. A group of passionate educators design our books. They design every lesson from Algebra 1 through the end of Algebra 2. Everything is done in-house through passionate folks who have been around for about 15 years. Our resources are then supported by other passionate people who either are dedicated to coaching coaches, sorry, coaching teachers at school districts so that the teachers know that they're competent and capable to use the resources, but they also are competent and capable to get students to talk to one another, to differentiate their instruction so that you can meet the needs of the high flyers and the folks who maybe are lagging a little bit behind. That coaching model where we have educators who have been in the math classroom and who are helping other teachers grow in their practice every day is an important thing that we do at Carnegie and I would submit we do it better than anybody else. We've been doing it the longest and our, our coaches are very good at not only encouraging teachers to give their best efforts, but also listening to them. Rather than being talker actors, they are collaborators like we ask our students to be in the classroom. So we have learning together. That is in our consumable textbooks. Lots of discourse, lots of different pathways um, <clears throat> to uh, correctly answering problems and uh, students verbalizing things. That is 60 to 80 percent of the class time learning together. We're learning individually, which is 20 to 40 percent of the class time. That's 60 to 90 minutes. Oh, and by the way, students can take math at home. So can it be homework? It can in limited doses. It also can be something that students choose to work on of their own accord. And I see that happen very often. So learning together, learning individually, and then the, the partnership aspect. Yes, sorry. Dan, can you, um, I just wonder if we could circle back to the question about will the students be taking group tests? How will this help the ones who don't understand or do understand when the teacher doesn't provide enough time and expects the students to have the same answers? So, of all of the districts that I support, I don't very often see students taking tests in groups. Group learning is an outstanding way for all of our kids to grow as mathematicians, as 21st century workplace ready mathematicians. For the most part though, assessment still needs to happen at that individual level. Each kiddo needs to represent to their teacher that they understand what is happening. And we support teachers in helping make sure that each student is progressing until they take those tests. We do have test formats that we leave to the districts, uh, well, within the district's repertoire. Those include what we call performance tasks. Performance tasks are group projects that um, draw from multiple concepts within a topic and encourage students either working individually or in groups to have a well-rounded answer. That, and that usually takes at least a full class period to complete these performance tasks. And teachers have guidance on how to evaluate students' performance in these performance tasks. Um, do you, would you have an example by chance in the curriculum that you might be able to show or pull up or send to Rochelle later that we could share with others? Of the performance task? Yeah, just to get us a, a sample. I will see if I can pull that up now. Okay, and then while he's pulling that up, one of the questions I think we can answer is what would the district staff say is the difference between math curriculum currently in use and these two options? What are the main benefits for changing curriculum and why were these the final two options? So one of the um, things I should have mentioned at the beginning, and my apologies, is in David Douglas, we follow the state adoption cycle. So Oregon Department of Education and the State Board of Education establishes a curriculum adoption cycle where content area cycles through roughly every seven years. Sometimes they, they change the cycle. So last year it was language arts, this year is math, 
next year is science. So we are on cycle with the um, Oregon Department of Education. And it is important to get new materials every seven years. <laughs> uh, a lot changes, things happen. So we feel really fortunate in David Douglas um, that we have been able to stay on cycle with the state. Um, Carrie talked a little bit about our process at the beginning of why these two curriculum. Um, so every program publisher that we started with, if you remember at the beginning, we started with 11 different programs and all of those 11 were vetted through the um, Department of Education first. So um, we had a state committee that went through and they reviewed lots of different programs and some didn't make it. And the 11 that we um, approved were actually approved by the State Board of Education as meeting the state requirements. So we basically took those 11 that meet the State Board of Education requirements and we vetted against our local priorities, which we'll review. And then we will, um, and then we came down to these final two. Rochelle would probably be the best person to speak how it compares with our current curriculum. Yeah, um, I taught over the last seven years at the high school. So kind of conveniently, when I first started at David Douglas High School, we had just adopted Big Ideas math curriculum. And um, I would say that in comparison from my experience as a classroom teacher, um, Big Ideas was very textbook reliant. Um, what that means is the lessons were not um, deeply or richly supported for from a teacher perspective. Um, and I found that it was challenging to differentiate appropriately for students in my classroom using the textbook as the main resource. Um, and so as we look into both of the new programs today, CPM and Carnegie Learning, it's really in that um, differentiation robust supports that the teachers are provided, which will eventually and, and naturally support the, the students in our classrooms because it's through the teachers having access and knowledge of how to use the materials effectively that we're able to support students across the district in every math classroom. So that's kind of the big difference that I see. Great question. Um, we also have a couple questions in the chat in reference to group tests. And I wanna just clarify, um, group tests are one component that we heard CPM mention as part of their um, group collaboration standards. And if we have any folks in attendance um, who have students who are currently trying the uh, CPM pilot experience, you might be noticing some um, I'm gonna call them growing pains. As we try new things, we experience new um, obstacles. And um, I don't know if that's really an answer to your question. We can definitely speak to it more, but I wanted to be transparent in that CPM has currently been piloted in classrooms across our high school campus. And Carnegie is about to start their pilot um, this week for the duration of March. And then Dan, I don't know if you wanna add anything in relation to um, that performance task, which I think is probably your closest connection to like what CPM calls a group test or a team test. Yes, and this, well, I would say that we don't necessarily prescribe group, group tests with current e-learning. Um, it can be done with the performance tasks like you see here. So you'll see that with this test, we have a real life scenario that focuses on patterns. And we have a prompt for the student to solve the solution, both algebraically and graphically, multiple representations. We want strong mathematicians. Our work is rigorous because we have high expectations and high support for your students. And then, so the the guidelines for how to answer it are down at the bottom of the page. And then the teacher guidance about how to grade this student experience is further down, along with some facilitation notes for this assessment should the teacher decide to use this as a more open-ended group project rather than a test.
Great, thank you so much. We've had great questions coming in through the Q&A. Um, we have Dan here for another five minutes. And if you'd like to ask him a question that has not been vocalized yet, or if you'd like him to show us something within the platform, please feel free to use this time. Perhaps some of you are typing. I just wanted to mention that I really appreciate community involvement. It is the missing piece when it comes to um, our implementations succeeding. Like they all, we all, we expect all of them to. So thank you for being here tonight. Oh, one other mention on community uh, questions. Just so you know, we have a family guide in each of our topics. So each each grade has about 25 family guides throughout the course of the year. And those help you as community members know how to support your students. They, again, just like the live hints, they don't give answers, but they help you with good questions to answer or good supports to provide to your students. These are available in Spanish as well as English. Thank you, Dan. We appreciate you being here calling in from the airport. Um, so I always appreciate your willingness to come in the evening and um, share about your program. And likewise, if you think of a question about Carnegie um, Learning and Math Solution that you would um, like the answer to later on, please email Rochelle. I did see she put her email in the chat so you can contact her. Um, and also I see that Dan put his email in so you could also email him directly, which is very kind of you. Thank you, Dan. My oh. pleasure. Like I said, it's great to see everybody here tonight. And thank you for your investment in our students' futures. Um, of course. And um, thank you. Have safe travels <laughs> wherever it is you are going. And with that, we will turn it over to Rochelle for next steps. Okay, thank you so much. I did get one more Q&A. Brooke could, or Elise, could I ask you to help me with that in the Q&A chat? Um, and I think we are good to go. Dan, thank you. Okay. Get our presentation back up. Okay, and the question. Okay, if there was a question that you didn't feel was answered, could you retype it and we will see what we can um, do for you? To make Thank sure you. we do want to make sure you get your questions answered so our apologies if we missed a question so please type it in and we will uh, make sure that we can get that answered for you awesome we will have another round of q a here in about uh, i'm thinking eight minutes so um should give you enough time to type that um i wanted to just bring us back to where you can find more information um, about both programs. I mentioned earlier that you can access demo accounts to really dive into the materials that students will be seeing on a more consistent basis um, with whichever program we end up um, recommending to the school board. So that can be found on our David Douglas website. And there is a feedback um, that I would really love to have your input on. It asks a little bit about um, your vision of the priorities and also your recommendations um, about both either or curriculum. With that, I wanted to um, give you a heads up on what do the next few months look like. So as we move out of February and into March, we have been piloting curriculum from both CPM and we are about to begin Carnegie Learning. Educators pilot the materials in classrooms with students, and they gather student voice through a Google form, uh, usually used on Google Classroom. Family and community input is given via the survey that I've been mentioning on our district website. And then we're also gathering teacher input um, from the math adoption committee as they review the data from the pilots and from the surveys. In April, we'll be going to the school board uh, presentation and making our final recommendation for approval. If they give us their stamp of approval, we will move forward with um, summer work that leads to our launch or our implementation in September. All math teachers across 
of David Douglas High School and Fur Ridge Campus will be supported with professional learning and provided with curriculum materials to implement math lessons with their students. We heard a little bit about the options of doing all new class classes next year versus what's called a slow rollout, one class at a time. And I'll have more information for um, the community after our high school administration and the high school math department makes a decision. Right now, they're leaning towards adopting and rolling out all classes starting in next school year. However, that decision has not been finalized. At this point in time, I'd love to um, ask you to generate any further questions for us. These questions um, could be directed directly at David Douglas School District. It also could be um, still for the publishers and we can pass those questions along if you've thought of something for Jenny from CPM or Dan from Carnegie. And I do see, I think we um, have our thank you for retyping your question. We definitely appreciate it. And the question just for everybody is, how is this curriculum going to help students if they copy off of others during team test? The students who mainly struggle will falsely believe that they understand the material and altogether they slow down the knowledgeable students because they have to wait and explain the concept. Um, so a concern over, um, reflecting the understanding of the materials and why do schools and teachers support the, a system that sets students up to fail and we wouldn't if we thought that would set students up to fail we certainly wouldn't engage in that but there is so much research that supports students working together um, doing team tasks getting to conceptual understanding and Rochelle can speak more um, about the tests but what, what I heard typically tests are not in a group setting it might be um, a task in the classroom for the day but the teachers still have an obligation to understand and know students individual proficiency level to see how they are understanding the concepts and Rochelle I'm going to let you um, yeah. stand on that yeah, thank you. Um, I definitely would love to know more about the specific situation that seems to be happening. Um, but I think that a private email would be delightful. That way we can get um, support to the student that was mentioned there in the uh, Q&A. But to reiterate what Brooke had said, um, we've asked our teachers to try different features of both programs, CPM and Carnegie. And I think what we might have discovered is there is definitely some room for improvement or maybe some room for um, educator learning to happen um, with these things called team tests or group tests. And so um, I would imagine that CPM has group tests intentionally, but have our educators learned how and why and when to implement them? That has not occurred yet because we've just been through the pilot experience. So, um, as Brooke mentioned, we would never want to set up students to fail, and we want to ensure that the materials and the classroom procedures are helping students to be successful. And if there's been something that has prevented success, we would definitely want to um, investigate and um, invite some more conversation to be had to hopefully um, lead to success. So thank you so much for asking that. And I do encourage you to um, reach out to me directly. Again, my email will come in the chat one more time before we leave tonight. We had another question for, um, does the survey give bullet points for each option? That's a really great question. Um, while I have this screen in front of you, let me just bounce over to the survey. scrolling all the way down to high school on that website. We click on this survey. It is going to ask you um, if you need a different version for your language. And then it goes into asking community members to first rank some of the priorities that you saw us mention today. Which of those do you feel like should be at the top of our um, list of things to really look for and ensure are in um, any curriculum 
And then to your point about, does it bullet point the curriculum? No, because I really want you to make your own informed decisions. And you can do that um, on the landing page where we accessed this survey. So I'll go back to that on the screen in just a second. So on this landing page, um, it gives you access and you can review the materials that you find to be most interesting. Maybe you wanna see what it looks like from the student perspective. Maybe you wanna see what the curriculum looks like for extra at home support. I'm not sure what you're looking for. And so I want you to have the freedom to explore what it is you're interested in. Great question. We're gonna remain on for a little while longer, um, give you time to type out any more questions you might have. We also wanna say thank you for attending. Wonderful. We might have a few of you leaving the session um, and that's just fine. Thank you so much for coming tonight. But if you are gonna stay on for more questions, please do. All right. We're gonna go ahead and sign off for this evening. We wanna say thank you. Um, Brooke, Carrie, Elise, anything else we need to mention? Sounds good. Thank you so much, everybody. And um, if you have questions, please reach out. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. And thank you to all the interpreters, translators. We know how difficult that is getting not only the words, but the spirit of the conversation. So thank you to everyone who is contributing in that way. Yes, we appreciate you. Thank you, um, Nate, and everybody for being here this evening. Mm -hmm.